case two is the equation u equals one minus x bar over L. And you're like, holy crap, where do we get those from? Once again, I'm gonna take us back to the commentary of chapter D and they describe all of this, but in this table, if you scroll down to the bottom, you will also see that they give this passage down here and it describes all of the variables that they have in this table, but it doesn't do a very good job, it just kind of gives like a summarization of them. So if you're still wondering, head back to the commentary and it does a very, very good job of describing everything in detail. As a brief stopping point, if you're liking this content in this video, please invite the like button to come to today's lecture in the auditorium, but give them the wrong room. Give them room 420D, not room 69A. All right, let's jump right back in. So we flipped back to the commentary section of chapter D. And again, that's page 16.1-282. And you will see that we have two things to solve for. We have X bar and we have L. X bar, as I've underlined, it's written right there in the passage, is the perpendicular distance from the connection plane or the face of the member to the centroid of the member section resisting tensile forces. And, and what you will see is they give criteria based on different sections that are in tension and how you can find X bar. So for us, you will see that they actually give a wide flange, because obviously we're a wide flange, and we have, just like above, we have a bolted connection, and they say, so as they stated in words, it's from the perpendicular distance from the connection plane, so this, the top of the flange, is our connection plane, and it's the perpendicular distance, X bar, to the centroid of the uh, section resisting the tensile forces. Well, you're saying, well, why is it up here? Why is it not just the, you know, the midpoint of the wide flange section? Isn't that the centroid? Well, it's not the full section of the wide flange that you get to consider. What they tell you actually in a condition like this is you actually have to treat the wide flange as a WT section. So you need to actually split this member in half and treat it as just, I'm gonna go blue here, and treat it as just this section. Now you need to find what this distance X bar is. And you're like, well, how do I do that? Well, what we're going to do is go back to the front to table 1-1 and figure out what WT section is half of a W8 by 21 wide flange section. That happens to be, save you a little time, WT four by 10.5 is one half of a W8 by 21. And what you'll see again, keep scrolling down. So now we have a WT section and in table, whoa, in table one dash one, they give you Y bar, which is that distance. And Lo and behold, in this scenario, Y bar is equal to X bar. So you can just substitute one for the other. Y bar in this case for WT is equal to 0 0.831 inches. All right, so we have X bar. Now we just need L. Let's go back to the commentary. In the commentary, they define L as the following. L is illustrated as the distance parallel to the line of force between the first and the last rows of fasteners in a line for bolted connections. All right, again, you're like, what's with these words? I hear a lot of talking, I don't see a lot of action on the paper. All right, settle down, Jose, settle down. So what does that mean? Well, I'm not even gonna draw it out right here. We're gonna go back above and we're gonna see what I'm talking about. So the force, you know, is acting along the flanges because that's where your connected members are. And so you have a force F along the length of this 25 foot long wide flange member. Well, they said parallel along the length of the force. So that would be in the direction of the force. And then the distance between a line of bolt holes. That would be this distance right here. Oh, and look, they have a spacing that they defined. It's three at three inches. 
So that would be a total of nine inches between the center line of the bolt holes from the start of the line to the end of the line. All right, so nine inches is defining our L. So now L is equal to nine inches. Let's just plug in here. So this comes out to one minus 0 0.831 over nine inches. This equals 0 0.907 inches. All right, that's our second U, and that's for case two. If we go back to the table in chapter D, not in the commentary, you will see that we actually have one more case that we should solve for, that's case seven. Case seven, it just gives you two uh, different criteria. Uh, is the base flange less than or greater than the two thirds of the depth of the member? We need to figure that out, that's easy. Let's see if base flange is greater than or equal to two thirds of the depth of the member. Base flange is, uh, is 5.27 inches. And is that greater than two thirds of the depth, which is 8.28 inches. Again, if you forgot these numbers, they are located in table 1-1 at the beginning under the wide flange size of eight uh, by 21. Two thirds of 8.28 equals 5.52 inches. So this is not true. So the base flange is less than two thirds of D, that means U equals 0 0.85. And now with all of that information, with all of that information, we look at our case zero, two, and seven, and we see which U is highest. In this case, case two is what we get to use. 0 0.907 is going to be our U. For some reason, I put U as inches. Let's just get rid of that, that was a mistake. Remember, we're still in our uh, tensile rupture case, and we need to find our, and we need to find our effective net area. Well, first, since we have U, we still need to find A sub N. A sub N, which is our net area, not effective, just our net area, is gonna equal our gross area. So if I draw our wide flange section again at the connection with our bolted connection here, so this is, a, again, a cross-section taken at one of the rows of bolt fasteners. So everything I'm dashing here, that is the you know meat of the section that has been removed by drilling those holes through the wide flange in order to connect via bolts. So we need to, the entire you know white section, if there are no drilled holes through it yet, that's AG, but, a N is gonna equal A G minus the red areas that we have removed because of the holes. Well, the bolts are defined as three quarter inch diameter bolts. So A N is just gonna equal area gross minus, there's four bolt locations. So four bolts times, we need to figure out the thickness or the, or the I guess the diameter or yeah, the thickness which would equal the diameter of each one of these bolt holes. Um, we need that, and then we need the this dimension here as well. So we'll call it X and Y. I know X is vertical and Y is horizontal, but just go with me on that, okay? So it would be, let's find the Y. Y we know is three quarter inch diameter bolts. So that's three quarter inch, but remember, for fabricating bolt holes, you add a 16th of an inch to the diameter, and you should account in your calculations for an additional 16th of an inch uh, to account for any damage in the field or anything like that during transportation gets it nicked up. So it reduces your overall steel by just a little bit. So plus two sixteenths, because that's a sixteenth for each, and then X is just gonna be the thickness of your flange, right? That's all, that's all it is. Well, thickness of flange, we know is 0 0.4 inches. Again, table 1-1 at the beginning of your steel manual. Come on, we're already there. We're way past that. And why we have. So, AG, again, table 1.1 is 6.16 inches squared. That gets us an A sub N equal to 4.76 inches squared. And again, we're still not there yet because we AE equals ANU, which goes to 4.76 inches squared. 
times u of 0 0.907 gets us 4.32 inches squared is our effective net area. That gets us phi pn equal to 4.32 inches squared times tensile capacity, which is 65 KSI as defined above. That's your F sub U. So that's KSI times inches squared. And then we just need phi. Phi in this limit state is 0 0.75. All of that comes out to 210 kips. And again, inches, kips per inch squared times inches squared. That just gets you a, a capacity, which is your, uh, which is your capacity, which is greater than 180 kips from our factored LRFD uh, demand. So we're still okay. You think we're done, right? Not yet. Hang on a second. We still have to determine and check the slenderness ratio to make sure that we're, we're within the applicable um, ratio uh, of slenderness for this beam size that we've chosen. Well, and you're like, where the heck do we go for that? Chapter D, it's right at the beginning. Why do I have headphones on? I don't know, I'm taking these off. So chapter D in section D1, you will see that there's a user note in a gray box. And basically it comes out to saying that your L over R should not exceed 300 for your connection or your tensile uh, design application of your member. So L over R should be less than or equal to 300 per the provisions of the AISC. Well, it's a 25 foot long member. Multiply that, get it into inches. And then over R, and in this case, we want R sub Y. R sub Y is in table 1-1 at the beginning again. And that's for our W8 by 21 wide flange member. R sub Y is 1.26 inches. And that gets you inches over inches, which equals 238, so it's unitless, which is less than 300. So we are okay in terms of slenderness for this design and the W8 by 21 that we chose for this connection. So we are good to go. Until next time, this is Rich with Team Kastava. I will see everyone later. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad all of you are back. Let's get the hell out of here. Let's enjoy that sunshine and that summer. Later.